Um, the, the story that just came across, which I think introduces a very, very important uh, general consideration. Um, and I forget the name of the Rebbe this is told about, but he was teaching and he came to a particular place in the Gemara. He usually taught in a very fluid, continuous way. He came to a particular place in the Gemara and he stopped and he was lost in thought for some period of time. And then his face lit up with a smile, which is what we would call the aha moment. And then he explained to the listeners what, uh, what he came to appreciate. The Gemara there tells a story about Rabbi Tarfan. Um, Rabbi Tarfan, uh, once his mother, he was apparently going someplace with his mother, and his mother's sandal broke, and he put his hand under her foot, step by step by step, so she got home. Um, sometime later, he fell ill. And his mother came to the Beis Medrash to tell the people there that he had fallen ill and to daven for him. And in order to impress upon them what a special person he is, she told him that story about what he had done for her. And the response that they gave her was, if he would do that a thousand times, he wouldn't come up to half of what the Torah wants for us, from us in honoring our parents. That's what the story says. So the Rebbe told the story from the Gemara, and he said, it does sound, I mean, in modern terminology, hyperbolic. <laughs> it sounds like what he did was very, very extraordinary, and the people of the base measures dismissed it as mediocre. He realized that he himself had had a similar experience, and now putting two and two together, he can understand both of them because his son was married to the Kutzka Rebbe's daughter. And his son fell ill, so ill that they thought he was going to leave the world. And the father was summoned and he ran to Kutsk. And when he got there, he was told that the Kutzka Rebbe didn't even come to visit his son and his own son-in-law. He's deathly ill, and the father-in-law doesn't come to, to visit the, the, the son-in-law. So this Rebbe went into the Kutzker, and he said to the Kutzker, you know, uh, your son-in-law, my son, is deathly ill, do you know that he's learning 12, 20 hours a day? I mean, how can you just ignore the fact that he's suffering and in danger? Kutzkerbi said, 20 hours a day? That's not called learning. That's not called learning. Like, he walked out of like in, in, dis, in shock and in despair and thinking that what? Kutzker doesn't appreciate my son, who's his son-in-law? <coughs> Several days later, the son recovered. So the Rebbe now is putting two and two together, the Gemara on the one hand, and the experience with his son on the other hand, and here's how he came to explain it. People are sent into this world often to fulfill a very specific mission. Sometimes a person has been in the world a number of times, and the soul is affected by the actions that, it perform, that he performs. Now, often the record that he, that he performs is a mixed record. Some parts of the soul get their appropriate development and perfection through his lifetime, and some don't. The Rizal teaches that what happens under those conditions is that the parts of the soul which have achieved their perfection are siphoned off and sequestered, no chance is taken by sending them back into the world that having been perfected, they will be damaged. And then the rest of the parts of the soul, which were not perfected, do come back into the world. 
And if you will ask, what do you mean, part of a soul? How can part of a soul sustain a human life? The answer is that in the Kabbalah, there's a basic structure of how things, how things are, are organized. And that structure is what's called fractal or self-similarity. As you go down levels, the same structure repeats itself over and over again. The smaller you, you, you go, still you still have the same fr structure over and over again. Um, I don't know if you've heard of, looked at fractal geometry, um, uh, but uh, a good example is if you take a snapshot of, let's say, the New England coastline from space, and then you take a snapshot of a particular uh, let's say 10 mile section of the coastline and then you take a picture of let's say a single stone with its jagged edges and then you take a, a picture of a very small section of the stone the jaggedness the irregularity uh, and the general contours are common all the way down the smaller the, sc the, sc the scale, but still you have the same general ca contours. That's called uh, fractal geometry or self-similarity. So one second, let me just the point here. So now, the piece of the soul uh, in Kabbalah, everything is based on ten. Everything is a matter of ten units. So you can think of the soul as having one through ten. But if you take element number four, number four expresses itself as 4.1, 4 4.2, 4.3, 4.4, 4.5, 4.6, 4.7, 4.8, 4.9, 4.10. Under 4, you have a whole elaboration of 10. So that if 4 needs to come back by itself, it can do that because it has within it the whole structure of 10. And if 4.6 perfects, needs to come back, there's 4.6.1. 4.6, 0.2, 4.6, This is a potentially infinite articulation. Every piece that you pick out re-articulates into 10. So that each piece could come back separately if it needs to come back separately. By the way, some remark that this is the reason why the lives of people tend to be much narrower than they used to be. Uh, Aristotle, mm. who may have been outside of the Jewish people, the greatest intellect that the human race has ever seen. Uh, no comparison between Einstein and Aristotle. Aristotle created whole new disciplines, whole new methodologies, whole new thought systems, and articulated some of them with great detail and great analysis and great originality. Today, when you're someone like Einstein, you have to realize that there are thousands of people working in the very same area, and he learned what they did, and he built himself on what they were doing, and he took the field a step further. Yes, it was a brilliant step, no question about it. There are those who say that others were on the cusp of it. They almost had it. If he hadn't gotten it, five years later, somebody else would have gotten it. Not to take away from Einstein's brilliance, but it's not like what the world once was. So if you understand that the souls that we have today are thinner and thinner slices of original souls, you can understand why the lives of people today are much more narrow. Okay, so let's go back to the story. So a person goes back into the world often to fulfill one particular aspect of life where he was deficient in a previous, in a previous uh, incarnation. Once that piece of life is fulfilled, he's done what he came to the world for. How do you know which part needs that kind of focus. How do you know which part? So there, it's very difficult, but one thing, if you feel very drawn and you make gigantic sacrifices for a particular area of life, that could be an indication that that is the purpose for which you were brought into the world. Okay, now imagine that someone is very ill, and in praying for this person's welfare, you say, Master of the Universe, you know, Look what a wonderful, what a wonderful success he is. He's doing this so exquisitely well. The response may be, oh, yes, he's doing that exquisitely well. 
Good, he's finished. That's what he was sent into the world for. And he's finished. He's done it. He's already succeeded in doing it. No, he doesn't need any more life. That's not a good way to plead for someone's continued life, for his recovery. This is what the Kotzko is saying. You're going to tell me that he's already an exquisitely accomplished scholar? Then what has he got left to live for? No, that's not called learning. If you want, you can touch it. That's not called learning for him, you know, because he could do much better. But that's the point. The point is he could do much better. So then it's reason to petition God that he hasn't fulfilled his goal. There's much more that he needs to do. And that's why to get uh, uh, kind of leverage on, on mercy that his life should continue. And that may be what the members of the Beis Medrash were telling Rabbi Tarfa's mother. Don't be so extravagantly pleased with what he's doing to honor you. It may be that he was sent back into the world to, fill, to fulfill this particular need for his soul, honoring, and you're telling him, you're saying, well, he's done it, he's done a spectacular job, he's already accomplished, well, then he could leave the world. And this, by the way, is the way we understand when people leave the world early, um, both the Arizal and the Ramchal died before the age of 40, and if you're not, if you're not tuned into our sources and our, our way of looking at things, you say, what a gigantic tragedy before 40. Even for normal, everyday people to die before 40 is a terrible tragedy. For them, excuse me, these people had the highest direct divine providence. They weren't missing out on anything. Nothing happened to them by, by accident. And the most reasonable thing to say is that if they died at such a young age, that's because the contribution that they had to make to the world was made. And there was no place for them left in the world. Anyway, that's that's the double story. Yeah, now you had a question. There's, um, <clears throat> thinking uh, about the idea that when, when we make the Gilgul and, and uh, the idea that in Ashray we're missing the letter Nun, and does that have to relate in any way like what the Rav just said about when somebody dies early is because of this idea of Hashem is preserving kindness for a different Gilgul or something? Could that be some sort of... That's why we omit the non? Like, because we don't want to bring that up in terms of judgment? Like, we... I, I thought of that. Uh -huh. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly that the, the nun, the missing nun in Ashray would be related to Gilgul. In fact, I think the missing nun in Ashray is a bit of a mystery. Because if you ask people why it's missing, they will tell you because the word nun is the beginning of the word no fail, which means to fall. And for some reason, they didn't want the word to fall to be there. Well, yes, but the letter nun is also the first letter of the word no sane, which means to give. If you don't want the word no fail to be there, put in no sane and have the letter there. Furthermore, there are many other uh, chapters in Psalms which are alphabetical and missing one or two letters. So that seems to be a general style. Now, as far as Ashray is concerned, maybe it's worthwhile, it's worthwhile knowing this. Let me show you something which I saw, this is a bit of a footnote, but in the, um, it's always bothered me, bothered me for many years, and I was in the, sh the base Medrash waiting for Mincha one day, and I picked up a safer on the table, which I had never seen before. It was a, a commentary on the Book of Psalms by the Mashkiach of the Yeshiva Chibin here in Yerushalayim. So I'll see the Yeshiva. And he asked this question, why the Nun is missing? And he says, if you look at the th preceding three verses, you'll see a pattern. The three verses before is Kavod Machus Yameru, Uvros Rehidabeiru, the honor of your kingdom they will express and your power or might they will speak so that's kingdom and power the next verse is to inform people of his power and of the honor and glory of his kingdom 
Sagali. That's the same thing with the opposite order. The first one was kingdom power, and this one is now power kingdom. Now the next one is your kingdom is a kingdom of, of uh, all time, and memshadukh is another word for kingdom in every generation. So this one is kingdom, kingdom. Okay, now can you complete the Miller analogies? Kingdom, power, power, kingdom. Kingdom, kingdom. Power, power. Power, power. The word for power here is gvura, and gvura is din. Oh, it's din. Strict judgment, strict accountability, no mercy. Earn it or lose it. That's why it would be no fail. That's why it would be falling. And then it means what? It means that King David set it up. He set it up for the clever reader. Of course, I'm not qualified. I didn't get it. To see that you're setting up an expression of gavura, of strict judgment, and skipping it by, by means of which you're saying this psalm is not about strict judgment. This psalm is about chesed, about loving kindness, about mercy. And the next six verses, six and a half verses, are all about kindness and mercy. So I think that's a good explanation as to why the nun would have been no fail. And since it would have been no fail, it, uh, skipping is what the message that the, that the Tehillah wants, wants to give you. Um, now, as far as saving a person for another Gilgal, I'm not aware of that motivation. Um, Gilgal is really for failure. Uh, let me think for a second. Well, maybe, maybe I'll change my mind on that because there is the idea that a person who will be put on, a person who's good, who has the right motivation, the right goals, the right values, but who is susceptible to pressure from the environment can be taken from the world early so as to protect him from being overwhelmed by the environment because God knows that at base he really is a tzaddik. This is what happened to uh, Hanoch. He lost 600 years. You go through the, the ages of people before the flood. He, on, on the list there, he lost on about 600 years. And so because he walked with God. And it says twice that he walked with God. And God took him, and he was no more. So the measure says because he was a tzaddik, but he was weak. And as the generations were deteriorating to the flood, he would have been overwhelmed. And God protected him by taking him from the world would make sense to say that another time, another circumstance, his soul will come back to the world to complete whatever it was that he had to do. So maybe that, maybe there is such an idea. I didn't think of it before, but maybe there is such an idea. It's not the typical idea, but uh, there, there could be such an idea. And may I ask yeah. a follow-up question? Yeah. Uh, I was looking um, at the moon also in, in the uh, 13 attributes. And that's originally what I had in mind in terms of preserving kindness. So, like, when Hashem takes, like, like the road just said, mm -hmm. somebody who's might not be his time to leave, but he's really inside righteous, is that the, the form of kindness that this is? That this is. It could, I think. I think it could. Re, it could. It could refer to that. And it's a good example, by the way, uh, that simply saying that the nun isn't in Ashray because it's the first letter of no fail is subject to a lot of uh, questioning. Not say chesed lahalafim which is a, a, an exquisite statement of, of kindness, is, 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 uh, is skipped over also. So I think that uh, the Chabinu Mashkia made a very, very good point on how to explain why it's missing. It's missing so as to, because he set up din and then skipped it to tell you graphically, no, that's not what this deal is about. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so in both stories, in the case of Rabbi Tarfan's mother and in the Rebbe's son-in-law, um, it's presented to the relevant party, in one case the bed base midrash, and in the other case the Kutzkarebi. There's this person who has extraordinary achievement and he's on the verge of death. The presumption being that because his achievement was so extraordinary, he has fulfilled his purpose and will therefore leave the world. And that's going too far. I, I, I didn't mean to say that we could presume, mm -hmm. but in both cases, the people who wanted to plead for mercy used his extraordinary achievement 
as part of the prayer for mercy. Mm-hmm. And that that element was downplayed mm-hmm. by the Beis Medrash and by the Kotzke Rebbe, because if you're going to use that as your argument for mercy, that can be turned around and used as an argument against you. Okay, so then why is the response downplaying and not celebration? As if to say, why downplay and not say, you're right, that's, that's precisely why he's on the verge of death. Is it just that's an unacceptable response to say to someone? No, but, but, but I'm, 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 not, I'm not getting it now. The, the, the plea on the part of the mother in the one case and the father in the other case is, please pray for my child because of X. Mm-hmm. And the response is, we can't, and, and the X is his exquisite performance of this mitzvah. Mm-hmm. And the answer getting back is, that's not the way to pray for his well-being, mm-hmm. because if you're going to do it on the basis of his exquisite performance, the response to your prayer will be, if his performance is so exquisite, then he's fulfilled his purpose in the world already, mm-hmm. and therefore he, does, he shouldn't continue to live. Mm-hmm. That's not a good reason for asking that he should continue to live. Mm-hmm. Um... Now, I think these, this story, these stories raise a couple of interesting general points. Um, one is, when you ask for something, and you ask for it on the basis of a reason, what I'm going to say now is obvious, it's just that people don't take it into account. Let's say you're asking somebody for something, and you're going to give him a reason. You have to make sure that that's a reason for him. You say, listen, I want you to do X, I want you to do X because of A. If he says, A? A is meaningless to me. I don't care about A. Then you've accomplished nothing. To ask for something on the basis of a reason, you have to know what the one you're asking counts as a reason, thinks it's important. That means what in the Tanakh, especially in the Torah, when you see someone asking for something and giving a reason, you have to ask yourself, does this person know what he's doing? And if he does, Let's learn something about the reason. So Moses pleads with God not to destroy the Jewish people after the golden calf, and he gives three reasons. Reading those reasons is really very important because you hear from Moses' prayer what Moses believes God thinks is important. Well, that's important to know. Now, even more fascinating is after the case of the spies, (coughs) Moses prays again for mercy, and he gives three reasons. And the response he gets is, Salach Varecha. And Dvarecha there, although it has a segol, is spelled without a yud. So that means, I have forgiven according to your word, not words. And the oral tradition tells us that Moses made three pleas, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu deemed two out of the three pleas as irrelevant, and only one was the reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu relented. So there you learn that sometimes certain reasons don't apply. That's gold. So um, when you when you hear a reason like this, you, what you what your understanding is that the reason has to be t- in taking into account the one whom you're a- 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 appealing to, and you have to know something about the one whom you're appealing to to be able to be able to do that, especially in prayer. There's a sefer called Shari Ora, one of the early, early Kabbalistic Sephardim. Uh, this is a, a style of writing which I think is very indicative of who our Chachamim are. He writes to another Jew who he calls my brother as a term of endearment, and he says, you're praying and you, want, you need things from God. I want you to be successful. I want God to hear you. You need to know that there are certain aspects of God's management of the universe that are relevant to this request or that request. And if you know which ones there are, and you meditate on them when you pray, your prayers will be much more successful. So let me lead you through each of the characteristics of God, each of the terms that are important, each of the prayers, so you'll know how to pray and be more successful. So it's the same thing. You have to know who you're praying to and what circumstances are are important to, in this case, to, to God's Baruch That's one thing. As a much more general thing that I want to mention, maybe this to you because you're insiders, is obvious. I want it for the recording and also to, to 
put it into a certain perspective. Um, let's go through this from the point of view of the petitioner. The mother in the one case and the father in the other case. They come, they're worried about their relative, they want to pray, they've chosen a way to pray, and what they're being told is, you're making a drastic mistake. This isn't the way to do it. This could be counterproductive. Think again. Do it differently. Um, learning Torah on the one hand and learning life on the other hand is a constant source of changing your mind. If it isn't, you're in trouble. If you aren't constantly changing your mind, you're in trouble. You're not thinking. You're not around people who are stimulating you. You're prejudiced. You're rigid. I change my mind several times a day, if not more. I have good chavrusas, very bright people, very learned people, changing my mind all the time. Now, you don't change your mind about fundamental things, even though you can't, there are nuances and applications that you, that you change your mind about. But when you're involved in serious study of any subject, you don't change your mind. There was a great economist, British economist, I forget which one it was, and he was interviewed by, by, by a news person about his views on XYZ, and he expressed them, and he said, the guy said, yeah, but 10 years, you were, you were singing a different song. And the economist said, when I become aware of new information, I update and change my views. What do you do, sir? Either you don't become aware of new information or you don't change your mind. Like, you know, is that better? You're criticizing me because I changed my mind? Like, that's nuts. So I think that I mean, well, we have had students here over the years, a few, who were here for several months. Every time the student opened his mouth to say something, it was a critique. An objection. A couple of them, after a few months, I took them aside and I said, you know, there's an interesting consistency in the comments that you make. Every comment is a critique, is an objection. Um, does it sound like you're engaging, engaging in a balanced investigation? You never think of anything to confirm the ideas that you hear? To support the ideas that you hear? Never? You only think of objections and problems? You know, a person who's open-minded about a new idea, seems to me, should be looking for at the idea from all different perspectives and should be registering the things that can be said in favor of the idea and the things that can be said against the idea. Seems to me from time to time, when I teach you an idea, you should say, oh, with that idea, I could answer this question. And then that idea is very useful. Or I read something in another book to also support this idea. You know, let's say once in four months. In four months, you don't think of anything that could support the idea? That sounds like the person is wedded to his opinion and just looking to knock it down. He's just looking for some way to knock it down. That's not balanced. And by the way, there's another technique which you, if you, I want to make you aware of it, if you're not aware of it, which occurs in discussion and certainly in debate, which is a trick which I, uh, I learned by being victimized by it, and, and now I'm very careful not to allow it to occur. You're discussing point A, and the other fellow is bringing, let's say, objections to A, and you're at the, supporting A, and at a certain point he says, well, but Q. If you think about it, Q is not relevant to the, to the debate about, about A. So he's changing the subject. Ah, but the word he uses to change the subject is but. But sounds like you haven't convinced me and you haven't succeeded in making your case for A because of Q. When you analyze it, Q is just another subject. The but is how he saves himself from having to admit that he's lost the debate on Q. Don't allow that. On A, right? On A, sorry, thank you. Don't allow that. He said, wait a second. 
We were talking about A, had different opinions about A. You're now introducing Q. What about A? Before we go to Q, what about A? Where are we standing? It's like the A. I think I've given you reasons that you haven't replied to. I think at that point, you know, you owe more investigation and perhaps be less, a little less certain about your opinion on A. If we agree on that, then we can move to Q. In the meantime, I'd like to know where we stand on A. Don't allow that face-saving move. Yeah. I have two interrelated questions. Yeah. One, how is, um, like, when we pass on halacha, is it similar to this idea? Like how some uh, posek gets the two machlokuses and, and he, like, takes it and he, like, sort of, like, is, is on par with, with, with the A and doesn't, like, is that is that how you have to be when you paskin? Meaning, like you don't you you don't allow yourself to be too rigid or too uh, what is it called too um, uh, allowing with 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 certain variables? You have to stay in like a sort of balance. Like I'm saying, how does paskin? I'm, I'm not quite sure. I follow your words. On the one hand, you're talking about being too rigid, and then you're talking about staying within a certain balance, which sounds like being rigid. So I'm not quite sure which way, which side. Well, you know, in the Gemara, often, um, often, people take back what they said before. Tos uh, ibiyadi. Also, you have tufta now. Tufta literally means refuted, and it works like this. Um, and Amora takes a position, and the Gemara will bring a brisa against him. And it will be argued that the Brysa uh, contradicts what he said. And the world will say Tufta on the grounds, at least some explain, on the grounds that we assume that he didn't know the Brysa. Tosu says in several places that the, the Amaroim did not know all the Brysas. They knew all the Mishnayas, but they didn't know all the Brysas. Mm -hmm. And since this Amora didn't discuss that Brysa, didn't do anything to respond to that Brysa, the assumption is he didn't know it. And had he known it, he would have given up, and that's why he's considered to be refuted, and his opinion is, is not followed. Mm -hmm. His opinion really, is really knocked out. But the assumption is, had he known it, he would have changed his mind. So the idea of being open and changing your mind has to be, has to be uh, part of your, your character. Beis Hillel disagreed with Beis Shammai most often when there was a resolution because Beis Hillel changed their minds and came to agree with Beis Shammai. The Mishnah says that explicitly. So if you're not prepared to do that, then you know, you're know you just not a candidate for any objective study, for any intellectual study. I shouldn't make it sound as if it's rare. It's not rare at all. Um, I, I taught the university for 10 years. Uh, one fascinating study of it was, as, as a department, you would have visitors come and read papers to the department. Um, we had some good graduate students. When I was at Hopkins, we were evaluated as number 15 out of over 100 graduate programs in philosophy. So we had a pretty good, pretty good faculty. And sometimes the person reading the paper would be caught by a graduate student. The graduate student would ask a question. It's pretty clear that the paper was deficient. The, the author of the paper would go into a spin and uh, start uh, pulling things, rabbits out of hats, and try to change the subject. And just to admit, yeah, you're right, I have to change that, you know, I'll have to work on it, was almost non existent. Was almost non existent. So, um, you know, the, the, the lack of objectivity, there was one professor who was, wasn't like that, very outstanding professor. I saw him at a group, and I saw him talking to a student. The student raised an objection. He said, maybe you're right. I'll have to, I saw that, I thought, wow, you know, he's different. Um, but in general, it was a very uh, combative and, and defensive and uh, self-proving kind of activity. By the way, someone noticed that, in, at least in philosophy, all the metaphors are, are military. There's an attack and a defense and an escape and, a, you know, an overwhelming argument and, all the metaphors are military. This, and of course, the, the feminists will say it's because they're all men. Came out, almost all are men. And that's probably true. <laughs> Maybe one out of a thousand things the feminists say is true. This, this will be one of them. Um, so this is, not, this is not the spirit in which a person is going to have a good chance of finding the truth. So that's the, the very fact that they, 
Now, where, where was their deficiency? Their deficiency was in understanding what God wants, what the place of the soul in the world is, what the world is doing with the soul. You know, fundamental matters of how Kosh creates the world and for what purpose people live. And these people could be mistaken. So that's, that's pretty fundamental. So that's, that's the idea of being prepared to revise, um, especially when you come across an idea which seems very difficult to understand, uh, and, and not to just simply condemn it, but live with it and honestly admit the difficulty, but be prepared to see things from a different perspective that you can't think of because the tradition is a deep tradition. I want to share with you two problems that I faced over many years. One I solved and one, one my Chavusa solved. Um, the world is created for the sake of loving kindness. That's the, was the goal that, of course, Baruch had in creating the world. Is that a chesed? Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, what I'm going to tell you now is the opinion of certain central sources. Not everybody agrees, but there are sources that a person's um, performance can be so bad that his soul ceases to exist. Doesn't go to the world to come, just ceases to exist. It gets annihilated. Mm. I found it very difficult to make that consistent with the idea of loving kindness. Second, even, in a certain way, it's even worse, where a soul could be punished eternally for its failures. Punished eternally. Eternal pain. That, in a certain way, in terms of loving kindness, is even worse than simply ceasing to exist. So, um, now I'm introducing you to the questions. You know, I should really tell you, and I'll give you the answer in two years, because I, I spent a lot of time working on this. My answer to the first question is this. We have the possibility of two methods. One method is to guarantee, as some sources say, to guarantee that no soul will be lost. There will always be some way to bring the soul back, to make the soul successful. No soul will be lost. And the other is, no, to allow for the possibility of such a drastically terrible life that the soul will be lost. Now, let's look at the position of the soul in the world to come. One level, at least, is where the soul, this is said in Chazal, the soul looks at its position of the world to come and can justify it detail by detail. I am where I am, I have what I have, and I lack what I lack because of my own actions. It's fair. Everything in the outcome is just. So now, and it means I earned it. I earned it, I deserved it. So that's your position and what you're, in, what you're being uh, inspired by and the way you have your relationship with the Kodesh Baruch Hu and the, what, what kind of Torah you hear from what sources. It's all a matter of what you did. All of that concerns your condition in the world to come. What about the bare fact of being there? Is that also something you earned? Well, you can only earn something if there was the possibility of losing it. To earn it means I've got a choice between A and B. If I choose A, I'll get it. If I choose B, I won't get it. And then it's by choosing A that I earned receiving it. But if it's guaranteed no matter what I do, then what I do isn't earning it. So there's a choice between two scenarios. One scenario is make it possible for a person in the world to come to have earned everything, including the mere fact that he's there. He's earned it all. But then that will allow that some people could be lost. Or no, set up a system where no one is lost, but then for all those who are there, the fact that they are there is a pure gift. They didn't earn that. So either way, there's a, 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 an upside and a downside. There's a, there's, a, there's a benefit and a loss. Is that not obvious? Which is the better system? So if it's not obvious which is the better system, then at least you don't have a good objection that the system we have, according to those authorities, the system you have that allows the possibility of loss, which then guarantees that those who are present 
will, will have earned it, that that's the worst system from the point of view of chesed. It's not obvious. And therefore, that, as, a, as an objection, it goes away. That's, I guess that was the easy one. That one I solved myself. But the harder one of eternal suffering, so I have the privilege to, to learn with Rabbi Chaim Carmel, whose father um, was a great Torah scholar in London, um, and who put out the Mikhtar Melio. He and Cyril Dome put out the Mikhtar Melio. And Rabbi Carmel, among other things, learned the, the Mikhtar Melio very well. So he said to me like this First of all, let's take this soul which is suffering eternally for things it did wrong. Is that the sum total of its experience? Is that all that's going on? Maybe what it's experienced, experiencing is a mixed bag. Some parts of it positive, some parts of it negative. Okay, now here's step two. Imagine you would ask that soul, do you appreciate the existence that you have? Or do you wish that you didn't exist? Is it obvious that the soul would say, I wish I didn't exist? Mm -hmm. Not obvious. It depends upon what the soul is appreciating, what the soul is enjoying, together with the pain, as a package deal, where the soul may say, no, suffering what I have to suffer, I accept that because, two things, because number one, the rest is certainly worth it, and also, I find a certain positive value in the suffering itself. Now, here's step three. This is based on, on Rav Dasa's writings. Step three. Why is he suffering? He's suffering because of something he did wrong, and his suffering displays God's justice. Justice includes not getting away with things. Uh, Gemara says... Anyone who says Kosh Baruch was a vatran, he just gives up on things, just overlooks them and discards them. Yivatu mo'o, his, his innards, his, his intestines should, should be destroyed, which is extremely painful. No, Kosh Baruch is just. For all the things that I did well, I'm being, I'm being rewarded. Things that I'm, I did badly, I'm being punished. So that bearing the pain is playing a role in demonstrating God's justice. That's a, 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 a performance of great value. <clears throat> so this soul could say, yes, I'm suffering, and there'll be no relief for the suffering. But number one, the package of my existence is definitely worth it, and the suffering itself is my participation in demonstrating God's justice. That too is worth it. Under those conditions, you could understand how even an eternity of suffering could be, could be something which is compatible with loving kindness. So I think that w when you hear solutions like that, it's it's hard ever to say that the door is closed on a solution. That what what, and I've read Rav Desta, but I didn't put the put, put the ideas together appropriately. And Rav Carmel taught me how to how to do it this way. So the openness to being prepared to change your mind is a crucial, crucial element in any honest intellectual success. You want to ask a question? Um, if the purpose of the world is a is a demonstration of chesed, or like a manifestation of chesed, then if, if that case, in, then in the world to come, the person who is enduring internal suffering is his responsibility is to bear the burden of or be the um, be the manifestation of din, which is a secondary quality to the purpose of existence. So this person is now satisfied with eternally manifesting an aspect of, of existence which isn't the primary aspect? Okay, that's a very good question. That's a nicely, nicely phrased question. But the answer is, you have to go back a step. If the purpose of, of the creation is chesed, lovely kindness, how does din get in at all, even as a secondary characteristic? How does it manage to get in? The answer is that din is a way of manifesting chesed. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. Din itself is a way of manifesting chesed. Otherwise, it couldn't get in. It wouldn't be able to get in. It's not, it's not 
primary and secondary. It's one. There's one thing which manifests itself in a variety of ways. Mm-hmm. And the idea, one of the ideas of Din as Chesed is that it is a greater achievement and a greater satisfaction to have something that you made for yourself rather than something which you were given for nothing. Mm-hmm. When you think of, let's say, things that people do for themselves just because they want to be that way, like being thin. I know people who can eat anything and everything on any schedule and they stay thin. They have that metabolism that burns it up. And then there's my fate and the fate of other people that I know. You know, where you diet and you exercise and you pray. <laughs> and you pray and you pray. And, you know, and, then, you know, and it works, uh, you know, depending upon your consistency, it works. Um, but when someone like us achieves a certain uh, good balance of weight, it's a much greater satisfaction. It's a much greater satisfaction because you know that you achieved it for yourself. So the manifestation of din is, a, is just the other side of the coin of manifesting that the things that you have, you had because you earned them, because there was an alternative. So that sort of is the, is the um, quality that expresses this aspect of the chesed. The fact that it's done through din is the quality that expresses this aspect of the chesed. The, the verses that start the creation of the world start with the word, the, the divine name Elohim. Elohim is the attribute of, of din, strict justice. And then starting with verse 4 of chapter 2, you have a combination, Hashem Elohim, and the Hashem, the Yudke Vavke, is a sign of, of mercy. And the uh, Chazal say, the first thought was to create the world out of strict justice. He saw that it wouldn't stand. He's not running a, a simulation on a, on a computer. And therefore, he associated, he added as a partner also the attribute of mercy. Didn't give up on Din. Didn't give up on it. Because Din is the highest quality chesed. The highest quality loving kindness. Some people aren't going to make it, so they need extra uh, uh, extenuating circumstances. But he didn't give up on it. The extent to which a person earns it through din is the extent to which he's getting the ideal outcome. And this idea of being punished is an aspect of being treated with din. Now, of course, these things have to be balanced uh, in, in ways that we can't imagine, but that's qualitatively, that's the way, that's the, way the connection works. Mm. At any rate, I think that Preserving questions on the one hand, but being open-minded on the other hand, is a very, very important element of intellectual balance. You have to be able to learn and change your mind, otherwise you're going to be stuck. You're going to be stuck in a rut, and, uh, and that will cost you. It will cost you a lot. Okay. Wow.